So you've got this idea of this radical monotheism. The Bible will not allow for more gods than one. And so if we're going to, even if we grant Joseph Smith prophetic skills, which you should not grant that, but even if you did, you could just ask, well, did he teach the same God that we find in the Bible? Right? And what's the answer to that? No. Uh-uh. He doesn't. Now, I know from their side, they're going to say, well, no, because he restored, the Bible has a corrupted view, and I just restored it. I get, I get that they're going to say that. But let's just understand, for clarity's sake, uh, that his view of, the, of, of God is different than the God of the Bible. And um, the reason why this is kind of interesting right now is this has to do a little bit with what, uh, what I've been writing about um, just recently, and, uh, and, and there's a... a publication called Dialogue, which is a um, kind of a, it's called the, a journal for Mormon thought, and there's a guy who publishes there, a philosopher whose name is Blake Osler. He, he writes sometimes, um, he's not an authority of the LDS church, but he's a thinker, and he recognizes that the, the, the version of God that Joseph Smith um, revealed is philosophically bankrupt, because it's an infinite regress of gods, one on top of another, on infinitum. And it causes all kinds of uh, theological problems and philosophical problems for Mormonism. Um, in fact, I think that view of God, which I would call the traditional view, the view that Joseph Smith taught, um, it, my, it, it, that, that any uh, natural theological argument that you have for the existence of God would also be an argument against Mormon theism of that variety. So what are arguments of natural theology? Anyone know what's a, what natural theology is? What are arguments of natural theology? Like Kalam, Kalam is, is a natural theological argument. Yeah, it's an argument for God's existence that doesn't require scripture. Design. The design argument? <clears throat> Ontological argument? Teleological argument? The what? Teleological. Teleological is the design, but you could you could run that through a fine tuning versus uh, kind of a Paley uh, Paley style version of it, um, and then you've got the moral argument, um, and, and, and there's there's a host of other ones. The argument from beauty was one that we were just talking about, Gabriel and I, with a friend of ours. Um, all all the, and the, from consciousness from rationality, you can get a lot of different arguments of natural theology, and every one of those arguments, I think, if if it's a good argument for Christian theism, they also end up being a good argument against Mormon theism. When you run it through the traditional view, because the, because what it, the kind of God that those natural theological arguments give you is a robust God who is himself the grounding or cause of all things, or who is the grounding of moral uh, values and duties. Uh, but the God for Mormonism that Joseph Smith taught is none of that. He's just another cog in the wheel uh, into an infinite chain that goes on and on forever that seems to have no beginning point. And so the Kalam cannot help him, but not only can Kalam cosmological argument not help him, but if it's a good argument, it also undercuts Mormon theism uh, uh, as, as a whole. Same with the moral argument and, and a bunch of other, all the other ones, I think, actually. And so what Blake Osler has done is he's tried to redefine Mormon theism in, into a more philosophical, more philosophically protected kind of theism that he calls um, monarcho-theism or kingship monotheism. And so what, uh, what my article um, that I just wrote is trying to do is persuade intellectual Mormons that that doesn't work. That if you're going to be faithful to Joseph Smith, um, that Joseph Smith's teaching on God is incompatible with this philosophical view of God called kingship monotheism, where he's trying to get the God that you need in order to have natural theology. Um, he's trying to get, like Osler wants a first cause of everything, and he wants that to be God. He wants a head God who's over all the rest of them, and, he's try and he tries to wrestle with some of Joseph Smith's teaching and, uh, and, and show that it's consistent. So what I do is just the opposite, is I walk through specifically these two um, sermons that Smith gave, the King Follett Discourse and, uh, what he call, and what's called the Sermon in the Grove. These are two of the more important teachings of Joseph Smith because they come right at the end of his life. This is more mature teaching. It's kind of the, 
he'd kind of been building and growing and developing his prophetic, um, you know, skill or whatever it is. I don't know. And it's been developing. And in these sermons, he kind of lays out the full kind of weight of where his theology is headed. And so he gives the King Paul discourse is named after a guy who um, had died, and he's kind of giving a funeral sermon. But he's giving that funeral sermon not like in a graveside scenario, but at a general conference with some 20,000 people listening. This is a huge event. This is kind of a monumental uh, sermon that Joseph Smith gives, maybe the most important sermon he ever gave. And uh, it's called the King Paul at Discourse. Uh, it's at their April 1844 general conference. And then later, uh, just a few months later, in June of 1844, he had gotten some backlash because of that sermon that he gave. So he gave that sermon. Some people left the church after that. Um, in fact, William Law, who was one of his apostles, uh, left the church and wrote a newspaper called the Nauvoo Expositor. And part of what the Nauvoo Expositor exposed uh, was his polygamy and, and, uh, and, the, and William Law and, and a group of followers' distaste in this trajectory of, of a plurality of gods. One of the things that they highlight. And so Joseph Smith doesn't back away from that, and instead, in his the last sermon he ever gave before, before he was killed, June 16th, he, he doesn't retract or, or backtrack at all, but he actually advances things even further still. And so let me just give you a couple pieces of, uh, just a, a taste of some of what he says in these sermons. It would it, be fun to go and, and read them. You can, you can find them. Mormon bookstores or Mormon um, sources or a lot of variety of places. But in his King Fallout Discourse, he says, It is necessary that we should understand the character and being of God and how he came to be so. For I'm going to tell you how God came to be God. We have imagined and supposed that God was God from all eternity. I will refute that idea and take away the veil that you may see. So he's telling people, maybe you grew up with a view of God that he was God from all eternity. He says, I'm going to show you that that's wrong. That that's not how God actually is. He says, here then is eternal life, to know the only wise and true God. And you've got to learn how to be gods yourselves, to be kings and priests to God, the same as all gods have done before you, namely by going from one small degree to another, from a small capacity to a great one, from grace to grace, exaltation to exalt exaltation, until you attain to the resurrection of the dead and are able to dwell in everlasting burnings and to sit in glory as do those who sit enthroned in everlasting power. So you've got to learn to be gods the same as all gods have done before. So he's starting to lay out this view that, um, uh, that is nicely summarized by Lorenzo Snow. He's got that famous couplet, it's called, that poetic kind of way of putting this. Anyone familiar with that? Lorenzo Snow couplet? How does it go? Do you know? As man is, God once was. As God is, man may be. Yeah, sharp. I love it. Yeah, exactly. So that's Lorenzo Snow, who later became prophet of the church. He wrote and um, uh, uh, published that during Smith's lifetime, and Smith affirmed it. He said, that's, that's good theology. You nailed it, Lorenzo. Um, and, then, and then Snow was later went on to be prophet and all that. Kind of sum, sums up this view that God was once just a human living his life on some other place just like you. And he passed his test, qualified for exaltation. Um, in the Sermon on the Grove, he says things like, The Holy Ghost is yet a spiritual body and is waiting to take to himself a body as the Savior did or as God did or the gods before them took bodies. So sort of this process of needing to get embodied, go through mortality testing in order to be exalted to the highest levels of Godhood. Intelligences exist one above another, and there's no end to it. This is what he thought. God is an intelligence. There's some other intelligences. There's more above him, and it goes on. There's no end to it. The head gods organize the heavens, or the earth and the heavens. The head gods, it's, a, it's always a plurality for, for Joseph Smith. And this is what Blake Osler kind of misses, is Jake, uh, Blake Osler wants there to be a head God because that would give us a little bit more of a, would give Mormonism a little bit more of a philosophically defensible view, but that's just not what Joseph Smith says. He says there's, uh, even at the beginning of creation, there's the, the head gods. It's always plural, and, and Joseph Smith makes that claim. It's plural all the way through, he says. And so there's just gods above another. How many? I, I don't know. It just goes on. 
forever. Why is an infinite regress of God's a problem, philosophically? Yeah. What's that? We're in the first one. Time. So you, you need another one. And, and you got to get the one before that. you got to get the one. And then, yeah. And you, if you don't have a starting point, you can never get the... You know, it's like that. It's like the idea. If I ask one of you for, um, you know, five bucks, hey, can you give me five bucks? And you're like, yeah, I'll give you five dollars. Let me just ask her for. It. And then you ask her, and she says, yeah, you can have five bucks. But I gotta ask her. And then and it kind of goes. And when do I ever get five bucks? Mm -hmm. If that chain keeps going, when do I only get the five dollars if it ever stops at someone who just has it to give without needing to get it from someone else? So if God always, if, our, if God's always need to get their existence from someone else, when does God ever actually come to exist? Only if you can get to one who has existence to give and doesn't need to get it from anywhere else. But their view doesn't have that. It's just, it's just infinite chain, and that's a that's a that's a big issue. So so the first test, Deuteronomy 13, teaches us um, that even even if we just accept for the sake of argument that Joseph Smith said some correct things prophetically. Um, we, sh we should still reject him as a prophet because he doesn't pass the theological test. His view of God is foreign to, uh, to the God of the Bible. But, but, but we shouldn't accept the fact that Joseph Smith is a good prophet anyway. There are lots of ways to show that Joseph Smith is not a prophet. Um, and this comes to the second major test that we ought to think about, and I'm sure you guys have looked at this before. With Deuteronomy 18, 20 through 22. Lauren, before we get into that, can we camp a little more yeah. on Osler? Sure. Can you explain why he arrives at the position he does when it seems pretty obvious from the King Follett sermon that God okay. became God? What does Osler do? Yeah. And also, good, can you talk question. about does Osler have our God? No, he still doesn't have our God. And in fact, at the end of the day, his view of God is still uh, is still not the God of, of natural theology and is still refuted by all the arguments for natural theology really? anyway, so he doesn't actually get out of the quandary that he thinks he does. Let me explain. Um, because he still believes, he wants to get rid of the infinity of God's bit, but he still believes that God himself is subject to eternal laws. And the way that his divinity grows or... Uh, the way that his divinity is expressed is in harmony with eternal laws and principles and priesthoods that exist outside of God. So there's still these external things to him that he has to lean on in order to get divinity. And, uh, and he could actually lose them. He thinks that God could actually lose those things, uh, that, he, that he could, um, for a variety of reasons, lose his divinity. To get divinities, so yeah, God so hasn't always been God. Then? He he has this developing idea that though he was divine in the same way that he believes that Jesus Christ was divine before he came here, but he's even more divine later after the after the mortal existence. So he actually grows in divinity and power and all of this. He grows still today as we are exalted. His his kingdom is enlarged, and that's this enlargement process. That takes going through mortality. But he believes that it's possible for God to have failed the test in mortality and, uh, and then been demoted and knocked out of divinity. Uh, or he believes that there needs to be someone to exalt him. And so it's possible that those other gods could have just failed to do so. And he could have been stuck without ever being exalted. So it's, a, it's still not the kind of God that we serve, who is from everlasting to everlasting God enthroned forever and everything else. Right? It's a totally different idea. But he just wants to avoid this infinite regress. And the way that he's doing that, even though, like I showed you from the King Follow Discourse and from the Sermon on the Grove, or Sermon in the Grove, the way that he tries to get around it is by amending the Sermon on the, the, the King Follow Discourse and by amending the Sermon in the Grove. And he does that because there are several different people who are recording that sermon at the same time. Uh, when you read the sermon today, the King Follett Discourse, you're going to read an amalgamated ver version. That is one that, that other, uh, Wilfred Woodruff and uh, Thomas Clayton, they took all the available records from that sermon, which is, is probably the most heard sermon of any sermon Joseph Smith ever gave. We have the most um, 
accounts of that sermon from any other sermon he gave, so it's not that hard, not that much as a doubt. But he'll just take that and he'll kind of try to grab a hold of some place where there's a difference in what one person shorthanded and recorded from what another person shorthanded and recorded, and he'll try to argue and change what, what he thinks Joseph Smith said in order to fit his thing. And so um, one of the things that, I've, that I do is um, walk through the changes that he uh, calls for and try to show that they're baseless, that, they, that, um, that that's a, a, a not the right textual critic kind of way to assess what Joseph Smith actually said. So that's one of the things that he does. Do all the versions state that God became God? Yeah, so, so this view right here, uh, let me show you this one, for example. Um, King Paul Discourse. Um, when he says, I will refute that idea, there's uh, one of the guys, one of the people who record it, it's all shorthand, so they're not giving you full sentences, right? He, what he says is, you have, we have imagined to suppose that God was God from all eternity. And then he says, if I will refute it. And so Osler says, if I will refute it. Joseph Smith doesn't refute it. He just says, if I will refute it. So, so he tries to find these little wiggle rooms. And so then what I do is I walk through all of the other accounts and show, no, there's actually a lot of evidence for him uh, willfully showing that he is refuting this. And not only that, but the one that says, if I will refute it, if you read on to his next line, he says things that, that, that understand that what he's meaning or thinking about when he's writing that is see if I, uh, uh, see if I refute it or, or, or watch me refute it. So it is affirmed, even though the way he wrote it is less elegant or clean or obvious, but when you read his fuller account, you see that what he says is actually meaning the same thing as the rest of them mean when, when he says it. So he tries little tricks and things like that. He, he uh, doesn't look at the ones that he cherry picks. He doesn't look at the ones that hurt his view, and he only highlights the ambiguity of one and elevates that above the others, which is a terrible. You don't take the, you know, the less clear and then use that to trump the more clear ones, right? That's just textual uh, interpretation 101. You take the more clear and allow that to interpret uh, the less clear text. And uh, he, he doesn't do that either. Is there a hand back there? Yeah. Um, so when you, when you look up under like the histories of the church, then they consider that just thoughts? Because doesn't that, isn't that when it's where it says the first principle of the gospel? Yeah. Is it most certainly that the character of God must know that he was yeah. once a man like us? Yeah, they don't, they don't deny what Joseph Smith is teaching here. That's why what, what I'll call the traditional view. It's the view that most Mormons have in their head. It's the view that's taught in the war. It's the view that all their prophets and apostles have taught. The, Blake Osler is an aberration, but he's a philosophically minded one. He's trying to avoid an infinite regress and get to a God that he thinks is more philosophically defensible, even though I think he's, his, product is, his project is a failure anyway, even if he's successful in his emendations but if he's successful then Mormonism fails it would still be it would still be a problem yeah but I think that even his attempt um, I think that a lot of Mormons they sort of use it sort of a oh no Osler figured it out intellectually like intellectually mind philosophical ones I don't know I think Osler's view is more philosophically safe not actually having like walked through the implications of it but they just sort of will punt to oh no mo uh, monarcho theism doesn't fall into the same traps. I think it still doesn't get them everything that they need, but what I want to do is even kind of preempt that by saying, um, actually his view is not compatible with Joseph Smith. So that's, you know, uh, just one of the things. So is his God truly infinite if he's always been God, but yet he's improving God like a process theology or he's something not, like he's that? Not in, he's not infinite. In any real sense, not like what He's you still and I would dependent think. on eternal laws and principles. Yeah, okay. still dependent, absolutely. Because that's one part that's super clear <laughs> that he can't fudge on. There's not a lot of wiggle room there because that's like in the standard works and stuff. So he's kind of stuck with this idea of of God, you know, having these eternal principles that are outside of him, 
and the priesthood not something he controls, it's something he inherits. But where? But the, ask the question: Where does that come from? Yeah. So it's not a necessary. Uh, um, he might want it. Nature. He might want it to be. Yeah, it's going to be a different nature. But he might want it to. He might even well say, "I think he's. I think he's a necessary being." It's just that there's all kinds of other necessary stuff that he's dependent on for his, you know, properties of divinity or whatever. So he might be able to use the Leibnizian argument. <coughs> On. So Price contingent and, and well, but yeah, um, but the intelligences and stuff, yeah, they could, a Mormon could do that anyway with uh, any Mormon, like Osler or otherwise, thinks that that matter is eternal. So they're they're eternal materialists. So that doesn't change for Osler or for a traditional. Mm -hmm.